Ambassador salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Salaamu alaykum. Sayyid Sukura. Nuku sana. Karibu mukatebe ko. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope uh, you are keeping well. Tonight is a special opportunity to speak to Ambassador Khalid Yunus Chinene, uh, a career diplomat who has been around for quite some time, very significantly relating to a 1970s uh, situation where then Ugandan President Idi Amin Dada went to address the UN General Assembly. He spoke in Luganda and then referred the ambassador to take on the speech. I think this is one man in whom a lot of experience lies and not much has been said. A very op big opportunity, a rare opportunity, I think, to sort of get to hear from him, speaking probably for the first time on some of his uh, career achievements. A diplomat by all standards, a person who went through uh, even languages, actually, which I think comes in quite handy when you come to uh, foreign affairs, Chinese, uh, Spanish, English, of course, and then Arabic language. and. Uh, with that, nearly well, 40 years of a professional career. He retired in 2002 from public service, and since then he has been sitting at his home quietly in Kagoma. But of course now tonight, I think we're going to open the lead on a lot of the experience that we have missed. Welcome to Sheikh Ambassador Dr. Khalid Yunus Kirene. I think for the very first time, you're going to be hearing a totally different story, a story that many of you have probably heard but never known how to connect the dots. This is Kasim Kaira, and with me tonight is Ambassador Khalid Yunus Kinene. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ambassador Khalid, uh, thank you very much for speaking to Fantastic Africa, and that's with me, Kasim Kaira. Very big opportunity, I think, to have you on. Uh, I think many viewers would like to know who is Khalid Yunus Kinene? Yeah, where were you born, uh, your, your parents, and so on? Well, before everything, I'm also very happy to have this opportunity of talking to you. And as you say, I'm not a very talkative man. <laughs> yes. I'm a very quiet man. But when it comes to something I can talk, I was born in Takachungi, Mukono, Chakwe. My father's name is. Yunus Kabara, now late. Mother's name is Mariam Namirembe. Uh, this was in 1938. That's when I was born. And your career now, your, your education, where did you study from? And well, first time I went to school, it was in 1945 at Wandegia. Muslim primary school. <laughs> and uh, from there, then my brother, now late, had used a concert, had organized for us Muslim young children to be taken to Egypt to study. At that time, Uganda was under British colonialism. And uh, our going there was not uh, known to the British. Uh, the British government was told that we are going to perform a hija in Mecca. So they organized it that way. We got passport, vaccinated, everything. And uh, we went with the late Haji. Musa Kasule mm. of one yes. That was a very big man at that time. Uh, so he took us together with his wives, two wives, but there was also Sheikh Idris Kibirango, mm. Amir Kibirango. This was the man who did a lot towards educating Muslim children abroad. So, the, he took first uh, time he took uh, other children. Then second time, then he, 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 when we 
he took us also. Mm. So I was among those people who were taken to study in Egypt. The trip was very, very long and hard. At that time, my view, people used to travel to make up. On foot, yes, yes, eh? yes. And by road, and so for us, we went from here to Sudan. Was that on Juba, foot as well? Juba, yeah. eh? by road, mm -hmm. by car. All oh, right, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, together with another man called Musa Kuwa. Mm. Uh, so we spent in the whole trip about three months from Juba, from here by car, on the river Nile, by boat, boat yes. and then by train and then by train again in Oswan, southern Egypt, mm -hmm. until we reached Cairo. We separated, we left Haji Musa Kasule, continuing the trip to Mecca. Oh, so the Hijja, the Hajj was, was actually there, was this there, is part yes. of, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So we, we continued to Egypt and we arrived in Egypt. Was the end of 49 50 down there, and uh, that's how we went to Cairo. This was already a lesson in itself. I mean, the journey itself was already a lesson before you even studied, started your studies, of, of course. Yes. And there are things which we cannot forget mm. because of that uh, experience, even today, we still, I still remember many things. Like, for example, what are there particular things that stand out? <laughs> for example, when we reached Khartoum, mm. my view, we went secretly. And Sheikh Idris took us to stay with some people in Khartoum. And he gave an order that no one should walk out of the house. Mm -hmm. We should stay inside. But as you know, young children always they want to play here and there. You are curious. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. somehow we some sneaked out of the house. Out. Yes. And he found out. So he was very annoyed with us. And he actually punched us. Mm -hmm. Some beatings. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, I can't yes, yes, yes. So he was a very big disciplinarian. Mm. You mentioned the fact that uh, to the colonial administrators, you had to say that uh, you were going for Hajj. Mm. Is that because if it was understood that you were going to study, they would, they would not, they would not have, they would not have allowed. By now, yes, they wouldn't have allowed us. I think. Mm. Was the if Muslim Brotherhood, for example, already in? If we are going to, for example, England or somewhere there, yes. no problem. Mm. But, but Egypt, Egypt yes. was different. So that's why he kept the whole matter. And sort of a close affair. Yes. Also because of, you know, this uh, religion, mm -hmm. the religious part of it, yes. you wouldn't have, you didn't have welcomed it very much. Mm -hmm. it is, okay. So you go to Egypt, you completed your studies, mm -hmm. and then, uh, but th that was now to Azhar. Where, where, where exactly did we went you study? To Azhar. Yes. And then in Azhar, we basically studied, took religious studies, mm -hmm. Islam and all that, what goes with it. And then we changed. We said we, we divide ourselves into two groups. Those who wanted to. Islam, religion, mm. throughout. Mm. Those remained in Al Azhar. Mm. But those who wanted to study secular studies, mm. like myself, like Ambassador Kiwi, mm. like uh, many people, mm. a few others, we chose to take the other side. We said, let us, we shall not all be studying. Religion, 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 religion,
let us take something sacred. And you chose what? Then, there we studied, we started taking secular studies, not religious studies mm -hmm. as such, until we finished high school. Then from there, this was around 1960. Mm -hmm. That's when we got, I got to go to study in China. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, I accepted. You, you, got, you got a scholarship to go and study in China? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I went to China. Mm -hmm. That's why I took a course in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And I could speak very good Chinese, although these days I don't use it very much. You have run out of... <laughs> <laughs> when it matters most, actually, now the Chinese have come so much here. Yeah, yeah. This would be the best time now to use your skills uh, with the language. Uh, yes. So, mm -hmm. but because of weather, mm -hmm. the place was very cold for me. Mm -hmm. I decided to change the place. And uh, to, I told the people, we had an office, Uganda office in Kaimu. It was being run by a man now his late John Kale. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how we got the scholarship in China. Uh, and when I, uh, because of the cold, they changed from me from Be Beijing to Havana. Havana in Cuba. In Cuba. Ooh, that's the quite something. Yes. The weather is very good there. It's right. Just like here. Yes, it's very, it's very tropical. It has yeah. tropical elements in it. And uh, there, I get chance of first learn Spanish. And then, uh, of course, uh, they are, they are being taught also French, Chuba, mm -hmm. and then studied political science, we studied international relations, we studied diplomacy, mm -hmm. and uh, from 63 to 63 to 66, when I graduated, that's when I graduated from so I'd like to pick up your brains regarding your experiences in China because now you, you've been to three countries that are so, so totally different mm. in their makeup. Mm. You have Egypt, which has some as Islamic aspects. Mm. Is, the Islamic Brotherhood, for example, at that time was already becoming a force to be reckoned with. Mm. The revolutions, Egypt was getting ready to become independent as mm. one of the first mm. African countries to become independent. Mm. You go to China, which was very communist at that particular moment. The Chinese Revolution was actually getting very close to happening in 1966. Mm. But you also end up now in Cuba, which had Fidel Castro with all the revolutions that were happening, taking place around the world. Mm. How was how did this play in, 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 in the mind of a young person of your age at that time? First of all, I must say that most of us... Mm -hmm. Radical students. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Radicals in wanting independence or in your views? One, what, what? Uh, the first thing is independence. Yes. So we are working even when they opened the Kai Band Office in Kai. Mm -hmm. That was the purpose to fight for the Uganda, to, to explain to the world uh, what was going on, that we must get independence and so on. So now, when I went to China, China was a different country. And the Chinese are very, very, very good people. Very kind, very polite. They don't harass you. They are very good. So actually, that aspect, I cannot forget it. And uh, quite uh, other things we, we learned about. The Chinese Revolution, the one nineteen eleven, yes, uh, Sun Yat Sen, mm -hmm. and then the one uh, the communists. Yes. Those people we are different, quite different from other places. So we we learned all those things from those things. 
used to read a lot of things about evolution, about Mao, and you used to see him, especially on national days. You would meet him or you just see him on TV? And, and when they used to take us when there is, for example, Those big days. the first of May, yes. and so on. as a students mm -hmm. to go and witness parades and so on and he used to appear on that place Tiana, Tiana, Tiana square. square yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and that's why so many things we learned from those people and then because of this problem I told you about called we changed to China to, 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 to Cuba and, yes now with the and Cuban and experience. Cuba the same thing. <laughs> yes. And then again, it was the revolution. Yes. In its, it had just started. Mm -hmm. It had just succeeded, taking over the power. Yes. And the same thing used to happen. So we had the Chinese experience and the Cuban experience. Yes. Both of which were sort of communist in one way or another. You know, the, the, the sort of the relationship was... For them, they were communist. Yes. China Yes, and the Cuban communists. That's, that's, that's what I mean. But now, looking at Egypt now, which was totally, I mean, I would imagine totally but, different. But Egypt also, Abdul Nasser. Yes, Abdul Nasser. Gamal Abdul Nasser. Was. Just overrun the monarchy. Yes. And he was also revolutionary. Yes. For us, that revolutionary part was the most important. Yes. We did not go into this thing of, say, I am a communist. Yes. I am that. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. But Aspect How of revolution. Imperialism. Yes. That was our inspiration. Fantastic. Now you graduate in 1966 and uh, return to Uganda, mm. and you get you get into the diplomatic service. How 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 was that? First of all, you left as a person who was going for Hajj. <laughs> so many years <laughs> later, <laughs> the Hajj was endless. <laughs> <laughs> <A> long one. <word. laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, now when when I came back home, mm -hmm. first of all, I stayed at home. Our house used to be at Kitintari here. Mm -hmm. That's my brother's house, my brother's house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started looking for jobs mm -hmm. to get work. What do I do? Yeah, I also worked for a short while, like a journalist. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> for, for what newspaper? There was a, 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 a magazine called Anur. Mm, Anur, mm. yes. And that, that one I was appointed to be the editor of that year. Wow. And who owned, who owned that Noor? It was uh, Muslim Communist, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then so with that um, newspaper, I didn't stay long. Mm. Because meanwhile, when I was working there, as I said, I was looking for a job. Yes. And uh, my dear, I studied international relations, international relations with all the experiences all now. Yes. So we are called to for an interview. Public Service Commission, mm -hmm. and we, we are three of us, my two of my colleagues, we are interviewed, and uh, they found out that we perhaps we could do something, and they recruited us. They recruited us. In. Was it a very competitive process? Was it something that you really, really had to fight for? It was not a, a, a no who. It, 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 well, a lot of what has happened now is sometimes you have the qualifications and you can't get a job. At uh, that time, we are not so many, yes. uh, and we are very much needed. Mm. Uh, we, we are in demand. Yes. So that's how we got recruited mm. and we joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yes, so you joined us as what in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Foreign Service Officer. Yes. What was that supposed to mean? What, what, what would the service, the work, foreign service, of, yes? Work in the foreign ministry, mm -hmm. um, with all the things you have studied, you receive diplomats, you deal with diplomats who are accredited here, yes. ambassadors who are being sent here, and visitors from outside, and so on. 
And then, after some time, you can say now, send you to search on such a country. Mm -hmm. Because even when we are being interviewed, I uh, was asked, I remember uh, people asking me, suppose we send you to a country like Mongolia, would you accept to go? Mm -hmm. Mongolia is a very, very, very far, far, far country, yes. And I said, no, no problem, I would go. Yes. So they noted all that. Mm. And then, then come the appointment to go to Kinshasa yes. to open the embassy. Yes. We are uh, three of us. Mm. French speakers. So suddenly you, you, you became much more important yeah. now on, on so, this particular mission. So, uh, whenever there was something, I would only be there. Yes. And that is how I was sent to Kinshasa. Oh, who will be there? And I stayed there for three years. Mm -hmm. 71. Yeah. 72. Mm -hmm. Recall back. Yes. And I worked at the United States Yes. And I was also being sent to other countries. Delegations. Member of many delegations. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from there, I could. From, from the mission, and uh, as also assistant, personal assistant to the minister. Of course, not one. I yeah. think Kibed was one of them. One make Kibed. One make Kibed. Yes. And also a man, another other, uh, that during the mean time, uh, a man called Ndoga, mm -hmm. also as foreign minister. And uh, I think that was it. Then they say it. Ah, now I don't know how it came. At one point, I was accompanying visitors. Mm -hmm. huh? I was accompanying visitors to visit a country within Which Uganda. Is, yes. National Park. Yes. Uh, see animals. So mm -hmm. see Uganda. And then I spent there, we spent there three days, different, different places. Mm. And we came back, these visitors were saying that by then it used to be called, uh, and now it is being called Serena. Serena, yes, and yes. It had another name. Yes. Uh, it was Nile Mansion. Nile Mansion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> uh, mm. Then, as I was coming back with the visitors, yeah. you know, the, the reception side. Yes. You've got to enter. And whom do I see from the other end coming out? Mm -hmm. That was uh, Idi Amin. Wow. And he had seen me, I think, before I saw it. Yes. And uh, as I did, I found that we are face to face. Yes. yes. And uh, he said, Oh, Ambassador, congratulations. <laughs> yes. Now, now you are Ambassador. Yes. I think, thank you, sir. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just out of the blue, he was already granting you the ambassadorship. For him, he had already, I think. Uh, Processed through everything, he it was just a matter of information. Yes, but informing me, just yes, informed me. Yes, how, how did that feel for you? It was a surprise. Yes, it was a surprise. Of course, I was a diplomat and all these things I had gone through them, mm. but for ambassadorship, yes, I was not. You're not the <laughs> yeah. Yes.
Yeah, so I mean, I'm just trying to wonder now what was happening in your mind. Were you excited? Were you scared? Like, no, like no seeing, scared. See, seeing the president, I mean, it's just out of no the scared, blue. I mean. but surprise. Yes. No scared. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, of course, in the ministry, they had already the information. All ah, right. And they said, okay, before you are posted, you have to spend some time here. Mm -hmm. Visiting here and there to know so more addition to get more information. So and that was ambassador to where now? Is that the the, the, the Congo now or Rwanda? No, Rwanda had already passed. Rwanda, you had already been. You yeah, went and I opened had been the for six months. Right. Yeah. Yes. And came back. Mm -hmm. This was now. So the UN general. The this UN was now 1973. Yes. So I spent. Uh, it was, uh, May June like that, 1973. And, uh, and to, to prepare for myself, yes, to go to New York. Being mm -hmm. around October, there, I, I departed from New York. Mm. What does it uh, entail to, to, to open up an embassy? Because probably before I take you to the United yeah, Nations, it's yeah. so. Like you go to Kinshasa, yeah, you go to Kigali, what do, what do you do? First what of do all, you? of course, you report to foreign affairs in, the, in that country. Yes. Country. Mm -hmm. See you, mm -hmm. see you, you, and the other uh, people there who work in the foreign ministry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Already first, the two countries have agreed to establish an embassy. An embassy. Yes. You don't just go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they have already... The foreign affairs ministers they, have spoken and the presidents are already aware. They are aware. Yes. Now, for you to implement, mm -hmm. you go, you look for the place where the embassy will be, uh, you buy which we going to use is that buying from the country itself or you can buy them from elsewhere and just ship them yes yeah. but mostly we all we buy we order yes we order from other countries mm -hmm. like germany like japan yes mm -hmm. so ambassador's car Staff, car, and uh, the other worker. Mm -hmm. So that is how we, these are some of the things. And also, you get to know many people. You get to know, interact with the, with the other diplomats from other countries uh -huh. who are also so in that country. Yeah. Yes. Until you get used to the place. So that's how, this is how, what it takes to go to mm -hmm. an embassy. And what sort of challenges would, would be would be there for an embassy? I mean, you are new in the place, yes, but you already have a budget probably that has been approved of for course, you to be able to of open the embassy. We are facilitated. Yes. No problem, but not much problem. Mm -hmm. And then the embassy, of course, you start working. For me, I was the counselor. Yes. Mm -hmm. People who want to come to Uganda, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they pass through me. Because I am the one to give them visa. Mm -hmm. So. No, I, I get, I, 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 I get it. No, I just wanted to sort of get a, a feel of the challenges because going into a new environment, yeah. especially now coming from an anglophone country, it's a francophone yeah. country. You but had the, the advantage language, of speaking French, language, so that was that was easier for you. But yes. also mm -hmm. the local language, say Lingala. Yes, I actually learned Lingala. Really? When I was there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? It's very French. Language. Yes. So you can speak it, mm. learn it very easily. Mm. As you, you interact with the people, uh, you get to, to know about it and to talk, to mm. speak it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You learned. Uh, you learned in New York. You've gone for your big position. I mean, it's all embassies, but this one is quite big. 
This is the international. This is this is the hot cake that many many ambassadors would want to go to. Ambassador to the world. Yes. That's how I took it. Mm -hmm. Not to one country. Yes. To many countries. Yes. So you arrive in New York. How how was that for you? Yes. Of course, people may expect me. And uh, all I need for me. Credentials. Thank you. In fact, I have pictures. Good, but high. No, the sector is there. And I presented my papers, and I started working. But also, you go to to know your colleagues, and there are so many. The African ambassador, especially. He needs to work in the not in isolation. If there is a problem, we put together and to take your position. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the recording is cut off. First of all, the OK was already there. Yes. And uh, we follow the policy of the OK. Now, to be an ambassador to the world, as you referred to it, representing your country to the world, at a time that was became becoming very difficult. You go in 1973, but by 1975, 76, the image of Uganda is beginning to change. Uganda gets under sanctions. There are efforts even to try to overthrow the government. How was that for you as an ambassador? How difficult would that be for an ambassador, especially having to represent the interests of a country that is under sanctions in some instances. But uh, there in New York, mm -hmm. with the exception of some few countries, of course, especially people like uh, countries like Britain, yes, like <laughs> USA, yes. But the other ambassadors, they mm -hmm. don't really bother you. Mm -hmm. Not that everything, everybody was a Kennedy in the other No, no, no. And uh, we used to socialize and work together, they invite you to their function. You are not isolated. No, I'm not isolated. Even the, <laughs> incidentally, even the American used to invite me. Yes. You spent the cool mm -hmm. But the ambassador was a friend of mine, mm -hmm. the ambassador of the USA. Mm -hmm. uh, the British. But uh, you cannot so so but you go and uh, as a diplomat, you just keep you, you keep your head high somehow. <laughs> now comes the time when President Idi Amin comes to do that famous speech that uh, he, he 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 presented to the United Nations. Yeah, maybe tell tell us, uh, give us a little bit of the background to it. When the president was coming, now he knew you, you know him hey. so well. You have to receive him when he arrives in New York. Yeah, he came. Yes. Which year was that? 1975. Yes. With a number of his ministers. And uh, when the day of his speech came, uh, he went to, of course, to the General Assembly, where he people uh, held the set of speeches. And uh, for him, he said, he was not going to speak in the imperialist language. He mm. speak in Uganda. And uh, that his ambassador, he says, my ambassador, then he will translate for me. Had he warned you about that? Uh, was, <laughs> <laughs> Just came no, out of the blue like most of his decisions. Me. Yes. So I said, okay. And I translated. He spoke for, for about 15 or 20 minutes mm -hmm. in Uganda. Yes. Then he had a prepared speech, mm -hmm. which he came with. And uh, this was a very long speech. And that is what I read. After the speech itself, let me see he made an introduction. What? To, what, to, to his written yes, speech, written yes. Speech. So he went off script with the introduction and yes. then you had to go yes. into the nitty gritty yes. aspect. Yes. Right. That is how it happened. Yes. And it took, it took about one hour. Yes. 
Wow. It's, it's not every day that you see a situation where the president is supposed to make a speech and then the ambassador is coming I've in to make. I've never seen it. <laughs> yeah. That is the only thing. I didn't. I have not seen anywhere else thing like that happen. Yes. It was. It is a unique thing because uh, the, all, all is the presidents come or the kings or what, and they speak. But they, they don't say uh, my, ambassador. my ambassador will come and translate. Mm -hmm. Especially though, because he decides to go. It, it was a bit funny that uh, Idi Amin, the late, mm -hmm. was not a Muganda. Mm -hmm. The fact that he chooses to speak Luganda mm -hmm. in an audience where even no translators have, had been provided for Luganda because no one okay, thought Luganda was. Took it that, uh, since I am Luganda. <laughs> <laughs> I know Luganda, you would carry the burden, yes. I Yes. So he spoke in Uganda. In mm -hmm. Uganda. Yes. Not in English. He could speak in English. Yes. But he said no. I spoke in English. Did it surprise you though that he chose to speak Luganda? Because probably he could have chosen to speak another another language, course, course. like Swahili. Probably where like other members in the East African it, community would have understood. Because I was not expecting it. Yes. <laughs> but he is okay. It's so okay. Nice. That is quite something. I mean, looking back now to that time, and uh, so off the back of the speech, the UN uh, finishes, you go into sanctions. Uganda continues actually to be under sanctions in the 70s. Mm -hmm. How does your time run out as ambassador then? Uh, do you get recalled? No, no, actually, for me, after spending five years mm -hmm. in New York, <laughs> I told the president, I asked the president for transfer. Right. That I wanted to be talking was in 1977. 77. But only that. Because I also had some health problems. Mm -hmm. They said now I may come back. He said, Oh, but he didn't comment. Yes. He just kept quiet. Mm. And the whole year passed. And then at the end, he told me, Oh, you remember what you told me? <laughs> I said, Yes, I do. Yes. Now I think you can come back. How, how, often, how often would you meet the president? Like to have such conversations? Would you have like annual briefings? Would you come back as ambassadors to have a one on one? Or? There was one when there are times when he meets the ambassadors, all yes. of us. Yes. From to different countries. Mm -hmm. There are times when you meet the uh, uh, times when you meet ambassador so and so ambassador so and so. So in this case it was not with our ambassador. So it was it was just me and him. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I told him I would like to come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. After that he said okay. And then uh, he said you can now prepare to come back. Mm -hmm. Returning to Uganda at a time that was very critical, the war from Tanzania is, you know, is intensifying. But it has not yet started. Oh yeah, because it comes in 1979 around April. Yeah. But I, I think the, the sort of resistance was started, already. But you could see the tension. Yes. I wanted actually to get your feel. So when you came back now, you went back to the Minister of Foreign Affairs? I was in President's office now. Oh, you went to President's office. Mm -hmm. As what? As advisor mm -hmm. international relations. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you actually now get an opportunity to advise? Because quite often you might find that you are appointed as an advisor who simply yeah, becomes at times, very dominant. At times. At times. Mm -hmm. Because I remember, for example, when they when they they invaded Kagera, yes. When they invaded Kagera, then they called us in the people's office and ministers and other advisors. And then, for me, I remember telling these people because the Amin said they had annexed. Yes, I got to hear. Then I said, but uh, 
Michael Lee. That uh, this is Twitter and international media. It is not allowed to annex other countries' territory. I remember saying that. So, I don't know how it came. It just came, see, you don't go annex another country's territory. So why are you suggesting that they should probably find a, a, a different one yes. to use? Or? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Maybe you go and withdraw. But to say I have an next, it means it is your country now. Yes. That is not done. It's not allowed under international law. So that's what I remember saying that. And what was the reaction that? Then? Yes. There was a, a, a minister called, is now late, Kili. 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 Mm. I said, no, 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 even Hitler, even Hitler, and next, <laughs> Poland, they uh, went all over the countries, just like but Russia is doing now know, with Ukraine. He, he could not understand what I was doing. Mean. Yes. Okay. And then you know what happened. Mm -hmm. After uh, announcing the annex, yes. it was the war. Hmm? Yes. The led to the overthrow of the government. Yes. yes. I think mean, that's that. that so 1979 comes, war breaks out, you flee into exile, you go to Kenya, mm -hmm. where you spent six years. It was a long story. Yes. I don't think we can think of it. Mm -hmm. But in brief, uh, when the war, when the, 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 the Tanzanians occupied Uganda, mm -hmm. Me and a uh, certain minister, Lubega, mm -hmm. his name was called Lubega, mm -hmm. we are on a mission in, in uh, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Amin had wanted Obasanjo, President, of, President Obasanjo, to talk to me and tell him, please, let us negotiate. Huh? Mm. And then that's the missing yeah? so that's the tale. Yes. So we told the Obasanjo. You met you met President Obasanjo. Yes. yes. And he said, okay, we do it. Yes. And after we did it, we told him that no, now we need to talk. But uh, the other man had already because he was gaining. Yes. He could not say no. He had momentum yeah. now, feeling like he didn't accept. So, were you stuck when the overthrow happened? Were you already back in Uganda or you were still in the mission? All ah, right, coming back, yes. Then they said, No, now you can't enter until you be occupied. Yes. And the Tanzanians are there, there's no aircraft are landing. Wait for about two weeks and then you can come. Mm -hmm. Then, um, who can wait it to about two weeks? But before the two weeks ended, the Kenyans arrested almost every Ugandan, mm -hmm. including, including. Uh, Professors, there was a lady called Nambos, mm. Professor Nambos, I think. Mm. The various the Akibwa, Akibwa, you know, the football, the, the athletes, mm. yes, and many others. We are all rounded up, rounded up, and taken to CPS in Nairobi. On what grounds? Why, 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 why was? You are Ugandans. You are these people, these things. Mm. From there, we spent about a week there. Then we took us to Kakameka. Mm. Kakameka, we are detained there for some of us for about a month. And then from there, so what were you being told while in detention? That why were you being held? Because you would normally be told, for example, why you're being held or they even be produced in court. They I think they had they had uh, some understanding. You return all those people. Yes. Mm. We shall sort them out here. Mm. And 
that is how after one month we have the same two years. So you came back to Uganda. So you came back to Uganda. Yes. And then went back to Kenya. Coming back to Uganda, we are taken to prison in Tororo. Yeah. And we spent about two weeks there. They are sorting out people now. So I'm so I this one let him so and so his ambassador so keep him. So so for me I was kept. They didn't release me. Until from tomorrow they are taking us from Singapore. And uh we are directing all the same thing of the former government. Yes. Then I was released. That's when I came back here. It's the really place. Yes. How did you find the place? Ah. Already looted and ransacked and ah. empty of everything. Looted. Yes. Looted too. They took almost everything. Where was you your family at that time? You Which one? The bottom one. The, yes. Yes. Oh, yes, I know Sheikh Mohabira, yes. yes. Now, that's where I was not staying here. You had to live at Sheikh Bira's house. Yes. There was no bed, there was nothing. I stayed there for about, for about 11 months. And then, uh, mm. now, after that, these people came again to arrest me. Said, uh, you are, I was wanted to be my master. And here, they had first of all, uh, uh, you know, my, they arrested my brother. He was the one driving my car. Mm. Then they arrested him. And now they, they do ask him to bring meet them here, where I was staying. And here, he came and he asked me, where is the name? I said, I am the one. He said, okay, you are wanted to die. Okay, I asked him to come in a few minutes and this that. And then he asked They had guns in the arm. They got the pistol. Yes. And um, which there? Asking questions, clear questions. Actually, what they wanted was for to take money from me. They wanted to first they came at around 12 30 here. Yeah. Mm. Midday. Yeah. Enough to make All right. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they said yeah, they are okay. Said now we have been in exile for many years. And then she asked, we don't have money. You can you can watch me. I told you, no problem. You want money, yes. But now, I told you, now it is too late. Banks used to open up to 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, if you give me time, tomorrow morning, I will bring you some money. I said, okay. Then they, they, they took me up to one day at the station. They released me here, there, and they will retained my Mm. And security in case you don't pay him. <laughs> now what I did, to mm. say, I say this is not good. Mm. The manager again asked for more lawyers. I said this is because now run away. Yes. And I did it. Mm. I went to the jump with the corner. Yes. 
Kasunge. I met my mother as soon as July. I said, 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 I went to Bikwe. I had some relatives there. And I spent two, two days. And then they are organized for my Exiting, yes. And I, after two days, we draw, they drove me up to the border, Busia. To Busia, at, at Busia I crossed. And then up to Kisum. In Kisum, there was somebody who was waiting for me. Mm. And then I spent there at this place. Two days, and then I told him, I'm going to my house. I have to buy some spare parts from there yeah. for our company, the bus company. He said, Okay, he took me to my yeah. own Texas. Mm -hmm. Back. That is now to spend the next six years. Six years. Wow. Now you come back in 1986 and you return after the capture of power by Yoweri uh, Museveni mm. with his rebels then and now uh, President Yoweri Museveni. Mm. What sort of guarantee, what sort of assurance did you get to come no, back? When, when, when you were uh, in exile, mm -hmm. you Oh, yes. Me, I was working in the embassy of Kuwait. Mm -hmm. In Kenya. Yes. That ambassador is now a very good man. One of the people that Yes. Very friendly. The Kuwaiti ambassador then to Kenya. Mm -hmm. I had gone before that, I had thought of visit him. Just a catasico. And to talk to him about my problems. Now, there was something very, very interesting. When I went and I didn't find him, I left a note written in Arabic. Very good Arabic. I hope I see you again. Something like that. And I left it in the second. So when the ambassador came back, now, when after meeting him, when I was leaving, uh, he called me and said, uh, Mr. Harley, the serious, showed me that piece of paper I had. Who wrote this? I said, It's me. Did you speak Arabic? You write Arabic? Yes, I speak Arabic. I said, Yes. Then he said, Why don't you want with us? Why don't you work with us in the same way? And then I said, okay, you miss three days, I'll give you my answer. And after three days, I went back. And I told him, okay, I think I'll work with you. Mm. That is how I came to work with him. Right. And it was a very good time I spent there. Many of my uh, 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 the other Ugandans, they are really having problems. Mm. Money problems. Yes. I didn't have money problems. Yeah. Mm. Where was your family? Because you had left your family behind. Uh, Did you get them to come my over? My family, yes. I started 
putting in them one by one. One by one. One <laughs> yes. by one. Yes. Until they all came. Mm -hmm. And God also gave me two twins. Oh. Yeah. Yes. So we stayed there for those six years. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, you were asking me about how so easy you found it. So sort of, yes. Now yes after I coming back, mm -hmm. Um, I came back for three months just to test the waters yeah. to get a feel of what was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I well, it seemed to be okay, mm -hmm. and then I said, I decided to come back for good return because I, I had become fed up. When I came back, I didn't see no figure until some people came here and they asked me. They said, you want me to come here? They said, you want me to come here? Some people turn up here, mm. they want you in the very infamous mm. Nile mansions. But this time it was no longer infamous. Yes. Mm. So there was a Libyan delegation. All right. Those are somebody had talked talk to them about me. Mm. Talk to them about me. Yes. And then, when I reached there, there was a sheikh called Matou Pizubedi. Mm -hmm. Very good man. And the, the one who asked me to, if I could accept to be calm administrative secretary of the Union of the Council. Right. East Central, East Central, Central Southern Africa. Africa. Yes. I said, okay, no problem. So that's how I became secretary. Right. Uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. But the government had to have a hand in that. The government would have to know or approve of someone when they get such a big position. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> now I'm just thinking because yeah. given the, 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 the strength of the position, yeah. the government would have an interest in yeah. that. It would be. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now there was Sheikh Kassim. Mm -hmm. The late. The late. No. Right. He was the secretary general. Yes. Of the the union. Mm -hmm. so, me, I am the administrative secretary. Mm -hmm. I deal with administration. Right. But unfortunately, he didn't live long. He didn't live long. Yes. After a few months, he passed out. Mm -hmm. And now I become what? The full secretary. Acting. Acting secretary. secretary. Yes. Until the next meeting of the of the union. Mm -hmm. General meeting. And there is where I was offered the post of secretary. Yes. I occupied that post for four four years. Mm. Now four years I said that was enough. And I come back here. Then again somebody comes here. Very famous place, this. <laughs> it, it has seen so many. <laughs> so many yes. Then they said, His Excellency would like to see you. So, yeah. And he wants to meet you to meet him tomorrow. Tomorrow morning at around 9 at 10 minutes. I said, No problem. So that's when I went to. They came for me, they picked me, and took me to the Devil State House. Mm -hmm. And I, there I met him. And he offered me the post of what? Advisor. Uh, no, they called him the provincial assistant mm -hmm. for political affairs. Yes. So I worked in, in the State House for almost 10 years. 10 years? Yes. Wow. Until I decided to retire. Mm. That's working now under two very famous presidents. No, I don't believe 
Oh, oh yes, I had forgotten actually the, 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 the coup. Yes, by 1966. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. The one who offered you the first time. Yes. It was under him because mm. it was the UPC government. Mm. And then what happened? Idi Amin comes. Ah. Yes. Idi Amin comes and offers you. Mm. And now you end up. And I'm seven. <laughs> Three very, very illustrious presidents who have, I mean, lived quite long in Uganda. That's that's a different take. Each one, I think, is different in the way. And then you're working inside their offices as well. Yes. That is, that's quite up close. Really? Yes. I said, this got the planning. Yes. We call it. Mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you relate with the three? I mean, looking at each one in terms of their methods of work. They are all good. They are all good. In their but, own way. But, uh, but when you work with the presidents, yes. Because they could see many of the community they are They were very ambitious. Mm. They sort of wanted to rise so quickly. Yes. So that's how it began. Mm. Me, I was a civil servant. Yes. And civil servant is a civil servant. Yes. So I think briefly that is right. No, that's that, that's that's quite very interesting. So, so many things I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> they they would wait to be published until you were dead. Well, probably at least you should do a recording somewhere, and then you know, many people just say mm. posthumous. <laughs> posthumously then they can be published oh, then. <laughs> right uh, now looking at your career probably if you had just a little advice for anyone i think you almost touched it towards the end of the your conversation when you say many people come when you walk around presidents you have to be careful mm. you have to know your position mm. many people end up burning their fingers yes. so if you had some advice just from a diplomatic point of view mm. working around not only just presidents but also leaders mm. What sort of advice would you give to, you know, a diplomat, an intending diplomat? Don't, to, don't try to... First of all, we, want, we work under instructions. Mm. You don't come and say things which are not supposed to be said. You don't come and uh, say the, or make a speech which will embarrass your country. You don't do such things. You must be with whatever you think and whatever you do. That's how you can survive and navigate through the waters. Once you start to say things which are not supposed to say, you find problems. Me, that is how I do it. Yes. And if you had just any advice, because looking at now as one of the few Muslims, looking at your time you know you, you were with people like ambassador ibrahim Muchibi, you mentioned at some point when you went to school um other few muslims that actually managed to get into public life you see that still the number of muslims is still small people who have gone for example into the diplomatic world into oh, the diplomatic oh. service or foreign service mm. why why is it that many muslims have not taken keen interest to sort of join say the foreign service especially considering our ability to learn so many languages yes I think it depends on the appointing authorities, not on us. Already now we have so many educated Muslims mm. in many fields, yeah? but still you can feel that there is shortage of Muslims in what in big appointments, yes. isn't it? Yeah. So this I don't know how to do. People have to to balance, to balance Muslim, Christian, give a balanced way. Mm. But it's not because they are we, we, they are few because they are few educated Muslims. No, so many of them. But if you look in the, in the foreign service, for for example, mm. you don't see enough of the Muslims even applying for those jobs in the in, in the foreign service. Do they allow? I don't know whether they are now. I know very few. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But if they could say, and also they could make provisions to, to, to say now, 
worth so many things. Not necessarily as many as Christians, yes. but you are so many. Yes. A certain number of Muslims come for interview. Provided you can pass the interview, yes. not because you are Muslim. Yes. Should have the qualifications beyond the Muslim. Muslim. Yes. And then you. Thank you so, so much uh, for your time. I'm sure there will be lots of lessons for people to pick up from this, uh, especially considering the, the kind of life that you have lived. You, you live a very quiet life for a person who has been to all these many places. To see you, you know now, I mean, old age comes, you get into retirement, you can sit back and be quiet. But there is a lot in you that probably could have, you know, benefited, for example, as a lecturer or as a public speaker all this kind of information is gone untapped how can you know you got and sort of tap into into your knowledge into your experience that you did that you have built up over time well, little by little. <laughs> <laughs> yes now we are here. yes yeah, yeah. this might be one way to sort of open up that okay my final question then to you is just regarding the world looking at the world today given the times that you worked as a diplomat and you look at the world today mm. In your times, it was the revolutions, it was independence coming into shape. Radicals. Then we get into the Cold War and, you know, what happened with that, America versus Soviet Union and so on, and with its allies. Now we've crossed into an age of uh, terrorism and whatever extremism, which is also dying down a little bit. But now we've gone almost into a new form of Cold War with events happening in Russia and Ukraine and, and the West. Let me, I would like to hear your own view of the world today. What, what do you make of it as a diplomat, as a person who now sits back and you can listen? It is something like going crazy. Yes. Yeah. Because things which you don't expect, you hear me had happened. Hmm? Like now the war in Ukraine. Hmm. How comes this war now going on? Yeah. Then you hear the terrorists. In, especially in the Middle East, there's a lot of uh, people who uh, just go to, to kill others. Mm. Uh, so I think the word like has gone mad or something. Mm. We uh, people should cool down. But each country also should make sure that it solves its own problems. Uh, because what brings about all this? Is the discontent, is the things which happen, people are oppressed by somebody, then this is it's a reaction. Mm -hmm. So, government therefore must review their, their behavior, they must see how to, how to treat these people, yeah? how they treat them. Otherwise, people will always, when people are not satisfied, they will do such things. Mm. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. Mm.